Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I am today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I just want to welcome longtime Cult of Hockey listeners uh, back to the podcast for another season. Some people will have tuned out over the summer. Just rejoining us now, uh, completely, uh, our audience is fantastic. I think we got some of the smartest, wisest hockey fans in the entire world, Bruce. I'm going to go so far as to say we have the smartest and wisest hockey fans in the entire world listening to this podcast right now. We appreciate your feedback and your input. We talked to many of you online, on Twitter. Uh, great to have you back. Today, Bruce, we were going we to talk about some big big news could potentially could have been bigger <laughs> a lot yeah. bigger if Duncan Keith had decided not to get vaccinated but um news is broken you broke yesterday that Duncan Keith made a late decision to get vaccinated he's going to be in quarantine till a week Friday I, I believe yes which would put him he as Holland said he can play the last three preseason games he's but he's going to miss some of camp He's going to miss preseason. He, apparently, Tom Gazzola of TSN reports he, that he got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a one-shot vaccine. It's a different, it's not an mRNA vaccine. It's a, more of an old-school vaccine, to put it in the simplest of layman terms, which is the only what I grasp. Um, like the AstraZeneca vaccine, these are these are based on older scientific technologies. And perhaps Keith uh, was more comfortable with that. Or maybe it just speeds up the whole process because it's one shot. I don't know. Yes, I think that's uh, maybe it's both. The reason. Maybe it's both. Um, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, Bruce. So, so this is what's this is the news, um, and there's also related news that the Oilers have still one unvaccinated player uh, on the roster. Uh, and Holland is talking with that player. Tip Dave Tippett is talking with that player. They seem to take an, a, a, a very patient approach with Keith, meeting with him a number of times, talking through the issues, looking at things in order to uh, help the player work through this decision. Sounds like they're doing the same with this, this player. Holland says they're not sure yet if they will welcome the player to training camp. Um, so he also says that due to quarantine rules, Anytime you cross the border back to Canada, it's a two-week quarantine. You'll miss at least 30 games um, mm-hmm. that way. He also points out that, you know, players who have been off for two weeks in quarantine, if the team's going well, will they get back in the lineup? That would, you know, seem unlikely. It, it all adds up to me, Bruce, that unless you're an Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisettel or Austin Matthews in Canada, like an absolute superstar, there's no way a team is going to be able to accommodate a more, like a, a non-superstar player that they're they would I, i'm not even sure if i don't know if they have the right to suspend that player or if they, if they would have to send the player to the minors i think they'd have to send the player to the minors but i think that would be what will happen in the end to an unvaccinated non-superstar nhl player in a canadian market todd bertuzzi of the detroit red wings apparently tyler, tyler excuse me tyler bertuzzi they've they have he's one of their top players on that mm-hmm. team they also have fewer road swings into Canada, I believe. I'm not sure what the vaccination rules are upon re-entry to the States from Canada, but he's just going to stay out of Canada. He couldn't play here anyway because the road trip would by, be over by the time he could play here. So he's just going to sit out the Canadian games, and and that's what they're going to do. He's also a player who had a big injury history. Maybe it helps him to sit out some games. Um, last year he had a fairly significant injury, I think. Um, missed most of the year. So... Anyway, I, I could see some U.S. teams perhaps being more open to this, but I cannot see a Canadian team being able to keep uh, that player. That player has a big decision on their hands. Let's start with the Keith decision, Bruce. What's your take on it? What do you think about it all? Well, the um, story that I think it was Tom Gazzola put out that it was uh, that he went for the J- Johnson & Johnson single-shot vaccine, which at least answers the one vexing question from the press conference of, how come a vaccinated player is quarantined and an unvaccinated player isn't from training camp? Because if Keith, and he would have had to travel to the United States to get the Johnson & Johnson shot that's not available in Canada. So 
Didn't Hazard? Gazzola say that it, it is actually available in Canada, Bruce? Oh, well, then, uh, then, uh, then it doesn't me, explain it. Okay. Let me just have a look here, Bruce. Um, I thought I might have I seen it. I don't remember J&J &J in Canada at all. But anyway, it's... Uh, it's oh, no, uh, no, no, no. According to Gazzola, you're, you're correct there. I was just reading a comment on Twitter going off that, which is a, always a mistake. Uh, to clarify, sounds like Duncan Keith received the one dose Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is administered in the United States. Right. You're correct. So now he's now so now he's enduring his one two week quarantine uh, while the vaccine takes effect because it's really not uh, not fully uh, uh, functional the vaccine until two weeks after, according to the to the experts. So. He waited till mighty late in the day to get it done, and it's going to cost him the first 10 days or so of uh, Oilers training camp, his first. Uh, so it's a, uh, uh, it's not helpful, uh, but it's a hell of a lot less unhelpful than if he had chosen the other route, which uh, there still is apparently one player, you know, who, oh, uh, according to Holland's estimates, will miss 30, 30 games. Because uh, you know, if you, you you can essentially you can play in one country or the other one with a you know, two week lag time. So you either don't cross the border into the states to play games, or you uh, uh, stay in you know, or you only play in the states. And uh, you know, neither one of them is really tenable, as you say. So at least Duncan Keith, once he is available, he will be available. What do you think of his late decision, Bruce? Uh, I'd like to think that um, it took too long, you know, uh, like, I mean, this word of how the NHL, how the NHL will be treating unvaccinated players has been out a lot longer than two weeks. You know, it's relatively recent. It came relatively late in the summer. I guess he had to work through a few things to uh, decide to get it done. And uh, I suspect that the organization may have put a little, um, I was going to say pressure, but let's say incentive of some type that it would be best for him and for his new team if he were to get it done. So to his credit, he went and got it done. You know, I mean, this is a, this is a segment of, uh, of the population that, uh, you know, latecomers to the vaccine, as opposed to those that are so vehemently opposed to it, that there's no way they're going to take it. And he clearly was in the other, the other group and decided, okay, it's time. I got to get it done. Yeah, I think some people, and I, I can't read Duncan Keith my Duncan Keith's mind. I don't know what he's saying, but I do regularly talk with on Twitter and uh, personal conversations. People are unvaccinated in their decisions mm -hmm. for, and um, I think I think many people were hoping to kind of um, wait out this thing and hoping that uh, COVID would go away and they wouldn't have to get vaccinated. I think that was a fairly typical response. We do know with Duncan Keith as well, he is a fitness fanatic and I think a diet mm -hmm. fanatic. So, you know, putting things in his body, like this is, this is right. someone who takes all of this very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I can see people like that taking the vaccine very seriously, including um, young, younger people like Keith and whoever else this player is, maybe even younger than Keith looking at it and thinking that the disease itself is not a huge threat to them and, um, you know, needing, you know, weighing that as well against the vaccine. You know, what, what I, what I've told people like that myself is like, I don't think, you know, for, if you're young and healthy, that the COVID represents a huge threat to you personally, but I don't think the vaccine re re really realistically represents any kind of threat to you either. Right. And when you're, when your job is on the line, when it's when your when your career is on the line, that should be a fairly simple choice, I think. But uh, I guess you know some some people see it otherwise. I suspect Bruce that the the holdout player will weigh things and will be coming back on the team. Uh, I think these vaccines passports work at a societal level with you know people in regular jobs, and I think this rule, which was made by the NHL players, by the way, and no, and, and the and the league. You know, the, the vaccinated players essentially said to the unvaccinated players, like, get vaccinated or mm -hmm. suffer the, suffer really dire consequences. I think in the end that uh, this unvaccinated player will probably change his mind. And I really I actually admire Ken Holland's approach. I thought his his tone and his messaging with Duncan Keith was perfect. He said there's no, you know, I like that there's no perfect decision. There's no perfect people. And 
um, things don't work out the way you'd hope. And I just right. like his his patience and his understanding with Keith and um, the, the tone that he took. I think that's the most helpful way to work through with people who are unvaccinated, This, which, which for them, which is a very difficult decision. And I applaud him for taking that. Uh, I think it, it, it maybe is going to go a long way in having Keith uh, be at peace with his decision and maybe for this other player when he finally makes his decision as well. Yeah, well, uh, we we won't name that player because uh, it has not been 100% confirmed, but we can yeah. name another player, Zach Ronaldo of Columbus Blue Jackets, who's been disinvited from training camp by the uh, – uh, by the um, Blue Jackets because he is unvaccinated and they just don't want him around. He's on a two-way contract and they're just going to assign him directly to the AHL. I'm not sure what I'd think about that if I was another player at the AHL camp, but as far as NHL is concerned, uh, he's effectively uh, uh, you know, put his career on hold, if not the end of it, which he was very close to the end of it anyways. And uh, uh, anyway... Zach Ronaldo. It's not like he's uh, um, uh, Zach Wierenski, right? But he's uh, uh, yeah. They would have to. But do they it have done that to different. Zach Wierenski, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Now, well, that's a good question. But anyway, yeah. Zach Ronaldo, uh, as one wag on uh, Twitter for it, put it, as the first time that Zach Ronaldo has ever passed up an opportunity for a cheap shot. <laughs> So I laugh. Uh, I'm not a uh, fan of that player. I, I never have been. I don't, and he's because he is a cheap shot artist. But anyway, that's uh, separate from this other issue. But uh, he's he's painted himself into a corner and it may cost him his career. There would have been hell to pay with if Duncan Keith, if Duncan Keith had decided not to get back. If vaccinated. Oh, man. Uh, Ken Holland would have just taken absolute hell. Now, in, in his defense, I think at, at the time that the trade was made, I think there was more of a hope, definitely more of a hope um, that um, COVID might go away with with high vaccination rates and that we might not be facing this, what we are, what we're facing right now. Uh, as the summer went along, that obviously became, it obviously became clear that that's, that's not the case. But, uh, you know, and as for the HL players who have to, like if, if I had an unvaccinated colleague, I, I'm vaccinated. Like I, I, I believe that this vaccination will give me all the protection I need. I, 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 I'm not sure that the players will be that worried about skating with an unvaccinated player, but each, each to their own and everyone's going to have a dif different reaction on that count. We also have news, for instance, that Alex Stalock, who had COVID last season, now has a heart condition. Now, I, I, the way Ken Holland described it, he didn't say a COVID related heart condition in, but he, but he did say that the, the same things within the same paragraph. So people will make their own conclusions and already have on that count. They may be related. They may not. I'm not Stalux doctor and I haven't heard. I don't know if I've heard definitively if he makes that connection himself, but we do know that COVID can have uh, in rare cases, some long-term serious long-term effects. And, um, uh, heart condition can be one of them. So yeah, some players may well have a concern, although they stay luck wasn't, no one was vaccinated at that time uh, when he got sick. Well, it's January. So maybe I don't think he no. would have been eligible for a shot at that point in any case mm -hmm. um, what? where he was. So he had no choice about like, he just, he got COVID like so many people did before there was vaccines. Right. Yeah. He got, he, uh, when he came to the orders in March, uh, March 1st, he was claimed on waivers. Uh, and at the time that he was claimed, uh, uh, he'd been sidelined all season with an upper body injury. Uh, and he revealed it to Michael Russo, the Minnesota writer for The Athletic, on the day he was claimed on waivers. And I wrote this in my post in March, so this is, this is not new news. In November... Uh, Stalock was stunned when he was diagnosed with myocarditis and inflammation of the heart muscle after testing positive for COVID-19. The risk with myocarditis is it can lead to cardiac arrest or sudden death, especially if an athlete gets his or her heart rate up. He abided by doctor's orders and did nothing fitness-wise for several weeks. And, and I'll jump ahead. In the last couple of weeks, he started to get on the ice. And last week, even backstopped the taxi squad for a practice. And then he came to Edmonton. And it was two months before he was, before he was activated. 
was around May the 6th, and he was never put on waivers. He was never put on the taxi squad. And so in theory, they wanted to have three goalies, but he was only available for the last couple of weeks of the season and never played a minute in 2020-21, uh, and now it doesn't sound like he's going to play a minute in 21-22, and the Oilers are on the hook for a year and a half of his contract. So that's a, a why Minnesota even put him on waivers. I never could quite get that, why he didn't just stay on the uh, unable to play list. But uh, the Oilers wound up picking in about a million dollars in uh, contract commitments for what's going to turn out to be not much of uh, probably nothing at all of, yeah. uh, of action from the from him and that whole third goalie situation that was just a nightmare last year yeah. from beginning to end. Just so it sounds like there. it sounds like the player himself from that article did make a connection between his condition and the COVID. Yes. Okay. Um we also saw Marco Rossi, I think his name is, the young Ottawa Senators player. He's just nineteen who uh had terrible long COVID and um sat out the year as well last season. So even with young people, as you've said, and as is in fact the scientific fact, even young people can have, uh, in some cases, healthy young people can have uh, severe uh, cases of this disease with uh, severe long-term consequences. Yeah, well, um, we'll see what happens next, Bruce. The COVID story is not over. Ooh. It is not over and uh, we'll see what happens in terms of attendance at Oilers games uh, going forward. New rules in Alberta. Uh, we'll see. It's just, uh, there, you know, there could be, what I'm trying to say is there could be more lockdown restrictions oh, yeah. uh, in Alberta. That's a definite possibility. So, um, you know, I'm hoping, I'd love to see fans at those games. And, you know, I, um, I think it's, personally think it's crucial that we get back on with our lives as much as possible. That said, there's a crunch that comes in the hospitals that can't oh. be denied by anybody. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. see what happens going forward. It was nice to see fans in the stands at the rookie game on on Saturday night. Uh, and this this was uh, I'd said in a previous con uh, podcast that there would be no fans in the stands. Turned out there was no tickets for sale. Uh, but they did have friends and family and invited guests that looked to me somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people scattered through four of the big sections in the in the lower bowl uh, opposite uh, and much lower down from the press box where I was viewing it from. So it was nice to see fans in the stands. What they did in that game was, uh, was actually a dry run for once they start the preseason. So they wanted to sort of get everything up and running, including admission to the building and uh, I think they had concessions, uh, some concessions open, just sort of trying to go through the motions of a regular game so that it won't quite be such a shock to their systems uh, as the entertainment providers uh, when the preseason uh, opens for Rio in a in, uh, uh, week's time. I'm sure I haven't internalized when the first home game is versus when the preseason starts, but it's coming up right quick. Good stuff. So training camp starts today. This is why all this, we're figuring out who's uh, showing up and who isn't showing up, mm -hmm. uh, which which who are the vaxxed and unvaxxed players. It's now coming clear. So much for medical privacy at this point. Um, that's the way the cookie crumbles when there's... Well, when stay locked. Get he may or may not be vaxxed at this point, but, he, you know, he's paying the price for, you know... Oh, not, the, not stay locked, no, but, but other the, players. But, but the other players, yeah, I mean... Bertuzzi and... Uh, yeah. It'll all come clear real Ronaldo. fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, I did a post yesterday about um, unanswered questions, wild cards heading into the season, what the biggest wild cards are. And uh, I didn't have on my list uh, the vaccinated status of players, which is clearly a pretty darn big wild card. Um, anyway, I had a number of other things on the list. Let's let's just go through it and let's get your take on some of them. So yeah, sure. um, can Darnell Nurse keep scoring at the same high rate? And my take on that is probably like, you know, the, the main criticism of it, well, he plays so much with Connor McDavid, he gets all these points and assists that way. Well, yeah. newsflash, <laughs> he's going to keep playing with Connor McDavid and keep getting points that way. I, I do think his, his shooting percentage will go like his, you know, he only had 19 grade A shots last year, Bruce, and he scored 16 goals. That's an, you know, Leon Dry, that's, you know, above 80% conversion rate. So, so he yeah. scored on a lot of grade B shots is, you yes. know, 
all those goals didn't he just come on gradation. Two goalies for sure. He surprised a few goalies. Now you know a high conversion rate on great on great for grade A shots is like a 35 percent. You know that's what Leon Dry's mm-hmm. title scores at. So I I could see Nurse's goal scoring coming down, but I think his points will be as high. What's your take? Yeah, it should be close. I mean, uh, we're uh, uh, he won't get a lot of power play time, but uh, he's mostly been an even strength scorer this entire time, and he's been among the league leader, leaders in even strength scoring from the blue line for the last three years, where you know he's in sort of top twenty in the league. Yeah. And last year, higher than that. I mean, he was number one in even strength goals and 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 high up the charts in in even strength points again. And I would anticipate points, but more assists than goals. I mean, last year's ratio sixteen and twenty. I think he was thirty six points. Uh, it's pretty unusual for a defenseman in terms of the ratio between the two. And of course, that was only in a fifty six game season. So that would equate to something over fifty points. In an 82 game season, well, if he plays all 82, I don't anticipate necessarily over 50, but I would ex- say 45 is a quite a reasonable ex- uh, expectation for Darnell, and that's a pretty good year for a guy that's not on the power play. Can Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Cutter Yamamoto rebound from their abysmal level of even strength scoring, Bruce? And to put that into context, Nugent Hopkins at uh, 1.2 points per 60. He ranked 343 out of 432 regular NHL forwards. So that's like fourth line production at mm-hmm. even strength. Play, while he was playing with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl much, a lot of the time. And Yamamoto playing with Dreisaitl ranked, it was at 1.4 points per 60 even strength, which ranks 293rd out of uh, 432 regular NHL forwards. So I think that's above 200 minutes played. So this is this what I think it's fair to say that was abysmal. Can they rebound Bruce? Will they rebound? Oh, you'd like to think so. I mean, yes, I think they will rebound to some extent, whether they'll rebound to the high levels you'd like to, you'd like to see from uh, guys playing alongside an elite level center is uh, um, an open question, but uh, I think, it worked out well for the Oilers in the sense that their uh, poor platform seasons led to both getting essentially a, a lower contract than we they would have got if they had contracts come due a year ago. Uh, and now the two of them are playing for uh, for this year for what about 6.3 million for the two of them combined. New alone would have cost more than that if they if his platform season had been one year earlier. So. Uh, they seem to be the favorites to, to line up with Drysaddle again. And Leon, despite, I don't know how he does this. Like, his wingers don't get a lot of points, and yet somehow there he is with 84 points in 56 games, 15 points ahead of any NHL or on any other team, uh, and trailing only McDavid. And, you know, he played, obviously, he played lots of time with McDavid, and they connected together a lot. But he also played a lot of time apart and still somehow found a way to pump in the points. So I'd like to think he'll get more help from his wingers this year. So I'll say, yes, they'll be better. And I will say that they need to be in the top half of the league in points per 60, given the opportunity. Yeah. Like, so top, um, if you're in the top six, like the uh, on your team, mm-hmm. um, well, so we're looking at like a, um, like a, what is that, 180 forwards in the NHL? 192 this year. 192. Um, you got to average about two points per 60 uh, to get there. So Nuge almost has to double what he did last year. He had yeah. some bad puck luck. He was oil and water with McDavid. Mc, Nuge is a passer. He's a give and go player. He's a combination player. McDavid's a soloist who will set up, who does set up his teammates uh, for shots, great shots. But Nuge and Hopkins isn't a great shooter. They are not a good combination. And they spent uh, many... <laughs> most of the season figuring that out last year. Uh, so I think Nugent's going to find, they signed Hyman. He's a much better fit for Connor McDavid, I think. And I think Nugent will be with, with dry settle. I'm not sure where Yamamoto will be or Puli but but they've, they've got so many options in that top six. Now, so many good players up there. Um, they're going to find the right mix for, for these players. And I think both will have considerably good seasons, which is going to cost the orders and, considerably better seasons, which is going to cost orders in terms of Yamamoto 
but it's a necessity with Nugent Hopkins. If he continued that level of even strength scoring, this his contract will be a freaking disaster. So let's hope that he does rebound. Bruce, can Tyler Benson and Ryan McLeod make their mark as NHL players this year? Uh, I'm going to agree with your take, maybe. Uh, yeah. McLeod, I mean, he made huge steps last year. Uh, but anybody who's writing his name in pen on the roster is maybe jumping the gun a little bit. He's got to make the team still. I mean, he only played yeah. the last 10 games. And he had very, very little influence on the game from an offensive standpoint. I think he covered the bet from uh, uh, defensively, like playing a two-way game. Uh, you know, his skating is great. I think, you know, I think his defense was, was certainly adequate. He was uh, uh, okay on the face-off dot. He looks like a center. Like originally I thought he'll wind up on the wing, but now I'm thinking he looks more like a center, but a bottom six center. Uh, I like his chances. Benson, he's paid his dues, you know? Like... Uh, so all this talk from Bob Nicholson about, about and and later, of course, Ken Holland about over ripening players. Well, he's certainly ripe. Three full years in the AHL he's played, and he got seven games in the in the NHL in that time. Part of it was bad luck that um, last year there was really border crossings were so difficult that once the player got sent down, he was done for. And of course, they they had this whole taxi squad layer of replacements when things did happen to uh, guys on the active roster that there was there was no chance. But this year, I mean, he's just signed a, um, his second contract. Uh, it's a very club-friendly contract, but they, the thing that's changed is they can't freely send him down to the minors anymore. They'd have to waive him. So that puts pressure, I think, on the team to at least give him a shot at the beginning of the season. I mean, they, they spent a very high second-round draft choice on the guy and have put five years of development into him, you know, for what? For this chance. Let's let's see what he's got. It's not like you can say, well, he just didn't cut it in the AHL because he very much did cut it in the AHL. He was a very good player down there and a, and a, and a high-level scorer. The trick with him and uh, uh, is he won't necessarily be on a high-level scoring line, right? He's not going to be on the first line of first power play like he was in Bakersfield, you know. He's more likely to wind up, you know, with all the signings in, uh, in the summer and the trade for Fogel, the signing of Heim, and the re-signing of Nugent Hopkins. All of a sudden, it's four left wing. That's kind of the open spot, and there's three or four guys battling for it, and he's one of them. And if you win that job, well, who's on your line, right? Are you on a line with Devin Shore and Colton Sevier? Or are you on a, you know, I mean, and how many points are you going to get passing to those guys? So it's hard to see where he kind of gains traction. And ultimately, I'd like to see him in the top nine. And I think that's the kind of player that he is. But uh, uh, how do you get from from here to there is the question. Indeed. Uh, Dave. Um, Ken Holland was on the radio uh, Original mm-hmm. Puzar on Twitter At Original mm-hmm. Puzar Who is one of the best follows uh, For an Oilers fan on Twitter I highly recommend that you follow At Original Puzar mm-hmm. um, He uh, pointed out, us to a radio interview with Holland Where mm-hmm. Holland says that uh, Tyler Benson must play his way off the team And he's penciled into the roster So that was interesting Holland seems to be recognizing the, his His length of service and the quality of his play at the HL level, which has been strong. But he Holland went on to say he's got to show it on the ice. He's got to go out and earn a, earn a job now. So that's what's before Tyler Benson. He's got a strong chance, though, uh, of doing so. I think he is a smart checker. He's good on the boards. I think he can be good defensively. Um, he is an extraordinary passer of the puck. He's not fast on his skates. He's not a great shooter. So his offensive game is somewhat limited. He he would mesh well, I think, with a shooter like Dreisaitl or with McDavid. I think he he could fit with McDavid. He he will get him the puck. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so better with Dreisaitl, though. Uh, I don't know if he's going to get that chance. Maybe on the third line, you just never know, right? Like um, how injuries play out and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, with McLeod, I, I would just... He's got to take care. He's got to be better defensively in his own end than Devin Shore at center, which isn't that hard. Devin Shore is not a great defensive player. His defensive reads are not fantastic. Mm -hmm. If Ryan McLeod can play strong defensive hockey, 
especially in the defensive slot, covering off his own man, you know, um, blocking passes into that defensive slot. He can make the Edmonton Oilers this year. The offense will take care of itself because he's a super fast player um, who's good with the puck on his stick, yeah. okay passing and shooting it. Uh, if he can, so face offs and defensive play, that's the key for this guy in camp. And if he can, if he focuses on that, I think he'll be on the team for sure. Zach good luck, good luck in the puck for sure, and, and yeah. between between the blue lines, you know, and the zone exits and zone entries, he, he can helps. do some of that yeah. on his own. And as you mentioned, original Pozar, he's uh, he's set me straight on an item or two, including one I mistakenly made in a recent podcast. I do make mistakes on this podcast. One was talking about the wide ice at the Olympics, which actually isn't going to be the case, according to him. They're going to be playing. NHL style, North American style ice at the uh, 2022 Olympics. According to original Pozar, who I believe on such items, when he's doing corrections, he's done his homework. Yes, he is a lawyer in his <laughs> real life. So he's pretty, uh, he's big on the details as mm -hmm. lawyers are. Yes. I made, a, I think I made a mistake. I'm not sure about this, but I think someone pointed out that it's, when I talked about trees being full of chloroform as opposed to chlorophyll. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you that'll didn't correct you me. <laughs> that'll knock you out. Yeah, yeah. That, that was that'll that'll knock those trees out. They weren't gonna not gonna last for long. <laughs> Big mistake on my part there. All right. Uh Zach Cassian. Can he mm. do enough to justify his contract? I, I actually don't see this as a wild card, Bruce. I actually think he won't. <laughs> I mm -hmm. think it's a good bet that he won't. Yeah. I mean, cause cause to earn that contract, I think it implies a certain amount of point scoring. That that Cassian has never really matched in his career except when he's played with top line players and I don't think he's going to play with top line players can he the, the question for me is you know he does he's a physical player he, he will chip in some points the question for me is that casting is will he be like a shutdown defensive player like are his defensive reads his work along the wall in the defensive zone advancing the puck is he going to be really super strong at that and again that's what he needs to focus on it's just always being positionally sound defensively, taking care of that first uh, above everything else. Because if he does that, he can be a useful NHL player, I think. But he's that contract, three point two million dollars a year for three more years. It was, you know, it was a reach then. It's even bigger reach now because of the flat salary cap. Your take? Yeah. Uh, well, we've been watching Zach Kaskin since Connor McDavid was a rookie. Yeah. That was the year the Oilers got him for Ben Scrivens. I mean, he's been here for quite a while. And uh, we have seen uh, um, flashes, uh, an extended flash is a good play. Uh, I, I go back often to calendar year 2019, which was the uh, second half of one season and the first half of the next season. And, and those, uh, in that calendar year, he played exactly 82 games and got 26 goals and 24 assists and basically all of them at even strength. And that's when he signed the contract, was right after Ooh, that. Yeah. But almost all that time, he was on a line with both McDavid and Dreisaitl. And for all the scoring they were doing, they were bleeding goals against. And yeah. part of the reason is that Zach Cassian is not a good defensive player, and I just do not see him ever transitioning into being uh, a good defensive player or frankly, even an adequate one. I think he is he is what he is, and and uh, a reader of the game he is not. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a proactive player. He likes to make stuff happen. He does have some good offensive skills. He he, he can make really surprisingly excellent touch passes, where he just chips the puck into into a lane where McDavid, for instance, can charge onto it and uh, make good things happen. Um, and of course, he brings the the physical element. When he's at his best, he brings a fearsome physical element to the game, and and that's in part what they're paying for. But last season, we saw almost none of that. In in part, bad luck with two injuries, but he just never got it going. David. In fact, he's never got it going since he signed that contract, and and he's got to bring it right from camp. He's got to. Yeah, aside from the physical play, like just in terms of on ice play, the owners would have been much better off going with Alex Chason over Zach Cassian. I know they didn't even have that choice because of Cassian's right. contract, but Alex Chason is an exceptional defensive hockey player. I don't think most fans recognize that. They're not really focused on that, but he's hardly ever out of position, Alex Chason, in, mm -hmm. in his own end. And he, you know, very reliable on the boards, uh, good decisions with the puck in his own zone. And they're going to miss that. Um, 
they're going to miss that uh, with him uh, on their bottom line. So I, I don't know about Colton Sevier, how strong he is defensively, Bruce. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I can't say. I, he's got some he's got some offensive game. Like he was an elite scorer at the AHL level by the end, but I'm, I'm not sure about his defensive play. He, he does kill penalties. I mean, remember all those years they tried Zach Cassian yeah. killing penalties? Yikes. Yeah. Okay, can Evan Bouchard step up into a top four role? I, I'm going to say based on his AHL, exceptional <sighs> AHL scoring for a rookie and his play last year, both in Sweden and the NHL from what I saw, it wouldn't be a surprise to me at all if by the end of the season he was playing in a top four role. I think he's completely capable of that kind of, uh, uh, of doing well in that kind of situation. End of the season? Yeah, by by yeah. mid season. I'm gonna say even okay. by mid season. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, by uh, it, it's certainly possible. And then it's also a question of how do you even define the top four? Uh, I think we're going to see with the Oilers um, uh, not necessarily a sharp division between the second and third pairing. So you know, I mean, if they they're playing the same amount of ice time, second and third pairing, which one is the second and which one is the third? Uh, I think it's clear that uh, uh, Tyson Berry and Darnell Nurse will be the first pairing. Uh, and in some ways, Evan Bouchard with Darnell Nurse would be an interesting pairing, but I don't think we're going to necessarily see that anytime real soon. But uh, he's uh, he's got to get the ice time. I mean, last year he was waiting in the wings for all but a month when Ethan Bear was out of the lineup, and otherwise he was watching games from on high. He needs to get the ice time. He needs to get the NHL reps and earn his way up the lineup. And uh, certainly it's possible uh, within the context of the full upcoming season. Yeah, I expect, I guess the way I would define uh, the different roles is even by even strength, ice time. Right. Um, the top four players, defensemen and even strength ice time are the top four. Uh, so last year that would have been nurse at 21 51 per game. Tyson Berry, 17 47 per game, Larson, 17, 19 per game. And then you have Kulikov Russell at 16, 39 and 16, 15 per game. So that, you know, it was Kulikov Russell or kind of, uh, Kulikov took over, uh, when he came in from Russell. So th- that would have been the top four with Bear, Bouchard, and Jones all outside of that um, last year. Yeah, I could see Bouchard playing in the top pairing with Nurse, um, taking over from Tyson Berry in that role. Barry has his struggles defensively. It- it's not a huge reach to think Evan Bouchard um, now in his third pro season will could be a better defensive hockey player than Tyson Berry is, and similar in terms of moving the puck. So I could see them making that decision. All right. The next wild card. Can Mike Smith have another good year? Great year might be the better way to put it, Bruce. I mean, he had a great year last year. He had the maybe the greatest year a 38-year-old goalie has ever had in NHL history, arguably. Can he have another good, great year? <sighs> maybe. <laughs> he, yeah. he was... Uh, he, he, he was... Uh, occasionally great and occasionally truly utterly terrible in his first season in Edmonton. His uh, from mid December or mid November to the end of December, he may have been the worst goalie in the National Hockey League in in uh, 2019. And then he had a very strong second half, and he basically picked up where he left off and had a very strong entire season. Uh, notably, he played a lot. Uh, he uh, uh, he worked extremely hard on his game last summer. And apparently, changed some of the fundamentals of his game that avoided uh, worked on avoiding the belly flops, where he's laying on his belly on the ice, watching the the puck going over him into the top corners. It reminded of Ben Scrivens, who uh, one opposing team referred to as the bear rug, because he laid on the on the on the floor with his eyes pointing. <laughs> and he, you know, not you said that. That's not very yeah. charitable. No, no, it wasn't. So anyway, <laughs> it, it reminded me of that on occasion. Last year, that mostly went away. A little bit on breakaways, he's tending to to fall into that old habit. But generally, he was way more stable and upright. And clearly, the results were there. Uh, he um, he does bring. I mean, his puck handling is a is a significant thing, and it's a significant strength after. 
uh, uh, some bad turnovers that led to actual goals against in uh, 1920. Last year, I can't think of one where he made a brutal mistake with the puck and then the other guy scored. He, he did make some brutal mistakes with the puck, but either he made the save or teammates made it go away or opponents missed the chance or whatever. But uh, And I can think of many, many plays where his handling of the puck made life a hell of a lot easier for Oilers defensemen instead of getting their face smeared against the, the glass by the Zach Ronaldos of the world. They had the puck on their stick uh, a courtesy, a good pass from Mike Smith, and they were able to then work it out from there. So that part of his game, I don't expect that to change even a little bit. Uh, he'll be fine. And I think Dave Tippett so liked that 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 was a big reason why Smith got the uh, the the lion's share of the starts once he was healthy. Yeah, so Smith um, had two weak up and down seasons previous to the one last year. So that's kind of on the negative side, like was last year kind of the last hurrah, mm -hmm. an exception. And that can happen too. But uh, we've also seen, and I've pointed this out before a number of times, like goalies who have great years when they're that age, they tend to, they, they can cluster them. Like mm -hmm. this does happen. And it's happened with kind of an interesting amount of regularity. Um, so we've seen it from Dominic Hasek, Jacques Plante, George Hainsworth way back when. Gump, <laughs> that's way back when, that's like 100 mm -hmm. years ago. Gump, Worsley, Martin Brodeur, and Ed Belfer. Belfer and Brodeur being more recently. So you, you do have these, I, it's fair, to, I would say they're exceptions to the rules, to the rule. But when, when they do have a good year, they can have three, two or three or four of them. So we'll see with Mike Smith. Maybe he's going to be one of these, these uh, unicorns. And, you know, he's kind of... If if there's anybody who looks like a unicorn, it's Mike wow. Smith. He's not a he's not a normal person. He's an <laughs> exceptional person. You know, he's he's a little different than the rest of the world, and, and in a and in a, in a really interesting and good way. I'm going to say, uh, you, you can see he's a real leader on that team, and mm -hmm. the team is completely enlivened and 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 different when he's on the ice. Partly yes. because of his puck passing, but also just because of his spirit. So okay. yeah, I. I'm going to give him, I'm going to, I say maybe, but I, I think it's maybe, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of bullish on that prospect. All right. Can, can Duncan Keith hold his own on the second pairing, Bruce? Um, that's the $5.538462 million question now, isn't it, David? <laughs> <laughs> Notice how that number rolls off the tip of my tongue. Yeah, yeah. That's the cap hit for this player for the next two uh -huh. years. And uh, holding his own, I mean, he's, I'm not sure that he's ever played second pairing. Like he's played 23 plus minutes every year, all 16, 16 years. years of his career, 23 plus minutes, average of 25 over the years combined. And so the second pairing, I mean, it's clearly based on his results in Chicago, uh, things have been going downhill for him for a while. But that hasn't been helped by the fact that he's been put in a, in a uh, mentorship role with young and, dare I suggest, struggling uh, defense partners yeah. who weren't getting the job either, uh, job done either, at least at the defensive end of the ice. I mean, with playing with Adam Boquist, for example. I mean, would you want to put him out there with Evan Bouchard? I'm thinking probably not. But what you need is a, a stable... Um, partner with them so it, it defaults to Keith and Cece and that defaults to being the second pairing but as we talked about Evan Bouchard earlier I mean maybe the whole, there's a whole shift during the year where they, they just gradually give more and more ice time to the third pairing a little, little less to the second but uh, we'll see it's a hugely important thing for the Oilers that, uh, that Keith come somewhere close to covering that bet so last year he played 227 on the power play, Bruce. I think those minutes will go. Um, could he be? No, he's not even be on second pairing because Nurse, Nurse and Bouchard will be on second pairing power play. Oh. I, I'm, I'm guessing. So he's there goes two and a half minutes right there off his, off his uh, um, minutes. He was at two, two, th uh, 23, 25 uh, time on ice per game last year. So he's down to uh, 21, uh, okay. or 20 minutes there. And um, yeah, 20, 21. Uh, so he, his even strength ice time will be probably about, he was at 18, 21 last year, probably be similar to that. And 
probably similar on the PK. I but I, I second on the Oilers, right? Yeah, nineteen twenty one. Only Nurse had more than that. Correct. I don't think. I think it, he's. It's. I didn't see him play last year, and honestly, when the Oilers played the Blackhawks in the playoffs, I was focused on the Oilers, not on Duncan Keith. But my memory of he him, well. I thought he played well. He was with Brent Seabrook all those years before, and you know that was a pretty good partnership. He's not going to be with a, a player of Brent Seabrook's caliber, you know, because Adam Larson's not here. Um, yeah, exactly. So it's going to be a little bit harder. Uh, and this is going to come up to my, we're ship, we're trending towards my biggest wild card of the year. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, he's not going to have that kind of super solid, exceptional defensive partner in Edmonton. And uh, we'll see how he does. I, th- I think it's probably about 50, 50, whether he holds his own would be my, would be my bet. So he's, I guess I, he's kind of a maybe ish. Can Miko Koskinen rebound? Bruce, he's had save percentages of 906, 917, and 899 in his three seasons. Will the real Miko Koskinen please stand up, way, way up? I don't know. I don't know what we're going to get with this guy. Bruce, he could come in this year and have us have a 915 917 save percentage again and we'll be thinking ah bring him back we'll bring him back at 4 million but bring him back or he could have an 890 save per save, save percentage it's, it's always hard with goalies with any goalie it's hard with Koskinen it's real hard i have no idea how he's going to perform no well i i didn't particularly like the wording of your question of Mikko Koskinen and rebound in the same <laughs> Same question. He he does give up rebounds, but he tends to give them up in tight where he's just covering off the the net. But uh, unlike Mike Smith, uh, Mikko Koskinen is pure stopper. He's not going to, as a puck mover, for instance, uh, you know, he's got to make saves. And so his save percentage, I think, needs to be better than NHL average. Yeah. Uh, he's consistently faced the last two years uh, way more shots per game than Mike Smith in both years, and that is not an accident. Uh, you can say it's the Oilers playing better in front of Smith, if you like, or you can say it's the puck going in the right direction more with Smith. Yeah. And Koskinen's more one to soak up pucks, right? And in his best games, he often faces 40 or 45 shots and stops everything. And and the other team just, you know, ramps it up and keeps firing away at him. And, and uh, he's had a couple of roles during his time in Edmonton where he's, you know, had multiple games in a row of 40-plus saves. But we've... Um, uh, I do think, yes, he can and will rebound. But whether he gets out above, you know, 9-10, I mean, uh, he, he needs to be... Uh, uh, you know he's a stopper. He needs to he needs to make stops. What will he fix that glove hand? I mean, I, I read things on Twitter that every single shot to his high glove side goes in the net. You know, it doesn't quite match my observation. No, that is not but, true. But but when he's when he's off his game, he is vulnerable. High glove. That I'll agree with. But. Yeah, he, he just he, his game kind of falls apart and weird pucks go through him. That's what I see with the player. Uh, yeah, uh, as other times he's just so bulletproof. The team starts getting spooked by this gigantic guy in the net and they start missing the net, right? Like they, they start, fi- <laughs> they just start firing really fast, mm-hmm. uh, hoping that'll do it. And they miss the net. That's when he's on. When the other team starts missing the net, you know, Miko Koskinen's having a good game. Bruce, my biggest wild card, and it often, it, in large part comes down because I haven't seen the player hardly at all. So I, I, I don't really have a sense of him is Cody Cece. Mm-hmm. So he, you know, he's a first round pick. There was rumors that he would be traded for Taylor Hall at one point to Edmonton. He played top pairing, I think, top four at least, top pairing in Ottawa for three years. Oh, yeah. Didn't work out. He got moved. Toronto and Pittsburgh the last two years, a little less ice time. He got positive reviews in Pittsburgh playing in the third pairing last year. But because uh, Oilers were desperate for a right shot D man and because of Adam Larson's departure, they signed him to a four-year deal at $3.25 million. It's a lot of money for a defenseman who's played bottom pairing essentially the last two seasons. Although I'm told by original Puzar again that uh, 
halfway through last season, uh, CC was moved up into a top four role and for the playoffs, and he did okay in that role. So that so it's, so there's that. So and, and again, this shows like I part of the reason he's my biggest wild card is I don't I don't know that kind of thing, and I don't know how he did with that time on ice. I don't know how he performed, but I do know Bruce how absolutely crucial it is a player being paid that amount performs for the Edmonton Oilers. If CC performs. It op- opens up a number of options. If you get Bouchard, Cece, and Barry all performing, you can trade one of them. Neither Barry nor Cece have uh, no movement, no trade clauses. Right. And we were talking about this last week, and um, it was Low Tide who mentioned, first brought up, at least that I saw the possibility, well, you know, to, to solve this issue of where you're going to get the cap space to sign Pulley RV and Yamamoto, you could trade one of, you could tr- trade Tyson Barry, for instance. And that hadn't occurred to me because I hadn't think hadn't been thinking that CC was going to be up to it. But if he is up to it, Bruce, if he can survive on the second pairing and Evan Bouchard can step up and play, also play on the top four, there's a chance you could trade Barry. If CC is valuable, there's also a chance you could trade CC. That could open up the cap space you'll need to bring back RV and or Yamamoto, um, a move like that. Because the Oilers have lots of young D-men in the minors who can step up and play for the Oilers. You know, there's Philip Berryland on the right side. There's Samar- Dmitry Samarukov, who played right side mm-hmm. in Moscow. This has to work out for the Edmonton Oilers' this contract. Yeah. It has to work out. Yeah. If it does work out, so many problems are going to be solved for Edmonton being a better team this year. But it's what I, I have no idea if it's going to. And I worry that it's going to be like the next Mark Fain co- contract. Your take? Three point two five million for four years. To me, that's four or five money. The guy can either be um, on your second pair, or he can be the top guy on your third pair. It's basically the Chris Russell money, and that's the role that Chris Russell has yeah. filled the last uh, four years. That he was on his four times four contract. It's actually a little cheaper than Russell was. And Russell, people seem to be more happy with him on the third pairing than he was on the second, but he did quite a bit of both. And if CC winds up playing on the third pairing, but doing well like he did in Pittsburgh, then it's still money well spent. Like, I'm not particularly keen to have a third pairing of two guys at NHL minimum. You know, you, you, you want to have experience on the ice. And he's, you know, he's got a lot going for him. Like, he's got 550 games in the NHL. He's 27 years old, and he is a you know uh, a, a, a bigish right shot defenseman with a you know a, a sort of a, a wide range of uh, skills, as Lotai likes to say. You know he, he's he's got a lot of different aspects to his game. I'm quite looking forward to watching this player. Like when you see him, uh, you know when he was with Ottawa in particular, you see him. T- two or three times a year against the Oilers and, you know, as an opponent, I, I, like yourself, I'm sure watch players on the home team differently than I do. And I study them in a different way. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing CC and I have a reasonable amount of hope for him. I'm, I'm certainly not going to go, Oh, Cody, CC, what a bad move that was, you know, I mean, we'll see. Maybe it was a bad move, but uh, he is a, a well-established pro in the heart of his career. He is that Bruce. So I, again, I don't, and I can't say, I don't know. I just, I just, I just have some trepidation probably just because of my own ignorance about the player. Maybe it was a good signing. We'll see. Uh, two postscripts here, uh, Bruce. Um, yeah. Tyler Bertuzzi will miss nine games in Canada this year. Wow. Give up $450,000 in salary doing so. So it's not 30 games. This is what I'm saying. Right. U S teams can probably afford to have a player like this. Canadian teams cannot. Right. Um, Frank Saravalli uh, reports that not done yet, but sounds like St. Louis Blues are working on an expanded role for former Oilers GM Peter Shrelly, who has served as an advisor to Doug Armstrong. Official title to be announced, but perhaps VP of Hockey Ops. Also, Ken Hitchcock to rejoin St. Louis organization as coaching consultant. Okay. So there you go. There. So Hitch is Hitch is done here. Done I mean, with the Oilers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently when when he signed in uh, uh, 2018 19, uh, it was a three year commitment, 
that the orders made to him that was one year of coaching and two more years as a consultant. And, you know, and they had the op- the option of keeping him on as coach. And of course, they didn't do that. They brought in at that point in time, Dave Tippett. But he has been here as a consultant for the last two years. And so they lived up to the, you know, the three year deal. And now that's expired and he's found new employment with old friends. And that's often how the hockey business works. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. All right, Bruce. Uh, is that it? Anything, anything, uh, any other, any other thoughts, anything you'd like to add? Uh, just that uh, when orders training camp gets underway, there's going to be a great big gaping hole on left defense where Doug Keith won't be available, where Chris Russell won't be available due to a neck injury for the first little while and where Dmitry Samarkov won't be available for several weeks due to a broken jaw. So I think we're going to see a lot of Philip Brovery in, uh, in the early parts of the preseason in particular. Uh, and I mean, just we'll see lots of reps for guys like Saita Cuckoo as well, because there, you know, there's three of the guys that would be expected to be not just fighting for a job, but in two cases, rock, you know, 100% to make the team. And Brovery's primary opposition, in some ways, the competition was uh, Smorkov, and he's out of the picture for the foreseeable future. Terrible luck for him. I mean, this would have been a great opportunity. And instead, he's, you know, drinking through a straw. You know, it's, it's, it's an awful state of affairs for him. But the team is a little sh- short there, so I think Brovery's going to get more of a push even than uh, than we might have expected. Really good news for Slater Cuckoo, and mm-hmm. even better news, Bruce, for someone who might not have gotten many games, William Loggison. Yes. Like if William Loggison now yes. gets into every preseason game, which is likely um, mm-hmm. until um, Keith comes back. I right. didn't know about the Russell injury. When was that announced? I missed that. Yeah, that was, um, when the heck did I hear that? Anyway, he's got a neck issue. It, was, it wasn't a Holland presser. Um, somewhere it's come out. Anyway, Chris Russell okay. will be will be wearing number six this year, which has also come out because his number four is about to be retired on November 5th, uh, Kevin Lowe's retirement, uh, sweater retirement uh, based on his Hockey Hall of Fame induction when the Rangers come to town, which is a natural fit. With, you know, say they'll be here presumably and there'll be, uh, you know, his other old team in the house. So that's uh, that's coming. And so Chris Russell's moved on to Adam Larson's old Number six, or is it Gary LaRiviere's old number six? <laughs> I like it when I like it when D men take the low numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good for uh, you know. So so Russell's out for a bit. Yeah, apparently, yeah, he's dealing with some kind of a neck issue. So okay, so um, yeah, Logason, Cuckoo, Brobury. Oh, yeah, so. they're all going to get games. Logus. Yep. Yeah, they're all going to get games. It's all good. You know, they're going to get some real looks. We'll see with we'll see how they do. William Logason, um, there was a stretch last last year about four or five games, and I think he got hurt at the end of it, where Logason was playing very strong uh, defensive mm-hmm. hockey with Adam Larson on a pairing with Adam Larson, and um, he he has to do that consistently if he's going to maintain an NHL job. But that was a very promising moment. Like when you see flashes like that for four mm-hmm. or five games in a row, you think, hey, this guy has a chance, and I think William Logason does have a chance. This gives him that that opportunity again. Yeah, he'll get his looks for sure. One last thing, Bruce. You saw uh, the owners with Stalock. They're not. Holland said he's not bringing in another uh, goalie so quickly, and which makes sense because I think if you're, I'm not sure. Like, so if you are, yeah, if you're vaccinated and you go across the border, like if they have to call up Stuart Skinner or Konovalov, they don't have to quarantine them, do they, or do they? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge question that I don't have the. I asked that question myself this morning. I thought, holy crap, are they still doing this two week cross the border stuff? And I went, no, wait, that was specifically for unvaccinated. For a vaccinated player, that rule might be different. But I yeah, not, we're not I'm not 100%. sure what the uh, NHL has worked out with the uh, with the border patrol on both sides, and it may be that in their quest to uh, Got the league vaccinated. They, you know, they they uh, advocated a lot harder for getting the vaccinated players easier access and and to make make things a little tougher for the unvaccinated. But that's but maybe, pure speculation on my part. 
Yeah, maybe you have to be in the, on the plane, like in the bubble of the plane. Like maybe it only applies if you're traveling with the team. I have no idea. I'm just speculating. What did you think? But what I wanted to ask you is, how did Conovat, this is the first time I've never seen him play. How did he look? He looked good. He looked good. He was, uh, I mean, Calgary Calgary was by far the better team in that game for the last 50 minutes. Probably the Oilers had a, had a decent start and they scored on a five on three um, but uh, after that, Calgary came on hard, and and Konovalov was, you know, I didn't think he had much chance on either the just two goals that beat him. Effectively, it was a two-one game with two empty netters, and uh, he made a number of strong saves, one or two rebounds that you'd like to see a little better control of. But he looked pretty polished, you know, and and uh, um, his net coverage was good, and, and his side-to-side mo- movement, like he was there and waiting for one-timers on cross-scene passes and stuff. Like he was reading and getting over and being in position when the guy let fly, which is a really good sign. Well, I'm hoping he is as good a tiny small goalie as Louis Levasseur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Louis was in slap shot, eh? Was he? <laughs> I remember he Former came in. Oiler, Minnesota Fighting Saint and Oiler. I remember Louis, he was not a good oiler, but I remember he came in uh, to Edmonton a couple of times with the Fighting Saints and just put on an absolute show. Yep. Uh, and that was my mandatory 1970s sports reference of the day. Bruce, thanks for talking. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.